OK, good morning, everyone. Let's get started. All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, two new models, so recurrent and recursive neural networks. And then uh, in continuation with respect to the previous lecture, so these are models that are suitable for sequential data uh, that does not have necessarily a fixed length. So we've already seen a hidden Markov model. Now we're going to see how a recurrent neural network um, is generalizing those hidden Markov models. And then the recursive neural network generalizes this even further. OK, so when it comes to variable length data, the issue is that all the neural networks that we've talked about so far that are feedforward neural networks, they assume that the input is of a fixed length. So we have a vector of input, right? So the x's are, um, there, there's a fixed number of them. And then that corresponds to, let's say, m different measurements or m different features. We feed that in. And then we have an architecture that works given this uh, input size. But now, if the input size changes, so as a concrete example, let's say that we've got a, some time series data. Um, so like we talked last class about activity recognition. Uh, so I might have, you see, a recording for a sequence of activities that might last, let's say, 15 minutes. Maybe the next recording could last 20 minutes. So for different um, lengths of, of sequences, then we cannot have a fixed architecture that would necessarily work with arbitrary length. Right? So, so that's one example. Another example would be um, machine translation. Let's say that you've got sentences in English that we're trying to translate into French. So here we might have a sentence of four words and then another sentence that has 10 words and another one that has 15 words. So you see if we're trying to have a, a feed-forward neural network that assumes a fixed length, then there's a problem. Right? So we could always do some sort of padding or truncation, but that's not ideal. Right? So we want some models that will essentially adjust with the length of the sequence. So uh, a solution for this in the context of neural network will be to use recurrent neural network. So these are going to be um, capable of handling sequences of any length. Now, in some situations, it's not just that we have a sequence, but we'd like to perhaps generalize this to work with trees or even graphs. And this will lead as well to recursive neural networks. OK, so uh, a recurrent neural network, the best way to think about it is that it is a, a, a neural network where there are some nodes that are recurrent in the sense that the output of that node will be fed back uh, as input to that node. So this creates a cycle. And now it doesn't have to be just with respect to one node. There might be several nodes involved into this cycle. But that's the main idea. So when we represent a, a recurrent neural network, I guess the most succinct way of representing it is by creating a little template like this here that shows how information flows. And then whenever there's a recurrence, then we create an arc. And here I'm using this uh, black square to indicate that this is an arc that is recurrent. And then uh, perhaps a simpler way of thinking about this is to unroll the network and see what this would look like over multiple time steps. So when I take this network and then I unroll it, then the idea is that at every time step, I would get some input x. It would feed into some hidden uh, vector h. And then this hidden vector would now have an output that is fed back. So that corresponds to essentially uh, a link from one time step to the next. And then in this way, the next h depends on a previous h, but also depends on x. So you see the succinct and compact way of depicting a recurrent neural network is using this sort of template. But it's not as intuitive. It requires a little bit of training to, to understand what, what this means. What is perhaps simpler is to represent the unfolded or unrolled version of the recurrent neural network, where now we can see clearly all these arcs that would be recurrent how they connect across different time steps. 
right? So here again, I'm, I'm using this little square to indicate that this is a recurrent arc and it will connect nodes from different time steps. So here um, you see it's a node from H to the next H, or it's an arc from H to the next H. Okay, any questions regarding this? Okay, very good. Um, okay, now when it comes to training recurrent neural networks, um, at some level, at, at least conceptually, it's not much different than other networks. So we're going to do gradient descent. And then a name that is often used in the literature is what is known as backpropagation through time. So here, backpropagation was the name originally for, for gradient descent. Uh, now when we say backpropagation through time, it corresponds to this idea that we have a, a recurrent neural network that we unroll over time. And when we do the gradient descent, what we effectively do is gradient descent with respect to the unrolled version of the network. So here you see, in theory, this network being recurrent, um, you know, would have um, some computation that just never stops. It just goes into a loop forever. In practice, what really happens is that we're going to stop the loop at some point. So we're going to um, apply the recurrence up to a certain number of time steps. And, and then we, we are really working with an unrolled version up to a certain depth, up to a certain length. And, and now we can simply treat this as a feedforward neural network and simply uh, propagate our gradient back uh, through this network. So you see at some level, training a recurrent neural network is not that much more difficult than training a regular feedforward neural network because we just unroll our network, effectively create um, a feedforward neural network, and then just do back propagation through this. Now there is still one difference. Um, the difference is that when you look at this network, um, the, because of the recurrence, the way we compute h at every time step is going to be using the same function f. So here, this little f indicates that uh, we have a function that takes as input the previous h and the current x and produces the current h. And then it's that same function that is applied at every time step. Now, if that function has some weights, right, it means that we're going to use the same weights as well at every time step. So there is a certain amount of weight sharing that occurs here. So just, just to be clear, let me write on the board an example of uh, a function f that could be used here. So f takes ht minus 1 as well as xt as input and then it will produce ht. Uh, but then one way of representing f, and here, I mean, the, it's, it's up to us, could be to, let's say, apply a sigma int. Um, then I could have some weights that multiply ht minus 1 plus some more weights that multiply xt. And here, let me distinguish those weights by putting here h and here x to indicate that there's a set of weights that are used to multiply h. There's another set of weights that are used to multiply x. Okay, so, so this could be a simple way of combining h and x to produce the next h. And then here I'm just giving as an example the sigmoid activation function, but you could have any activation function you want. Now more generally, f doesn't have to be just one simple function like this. It could be a whole composition of functions, right? So we could imagine having an entire uh, deep neural network just to compute what the next h is going to be. And we're going to see in a moment some architectures that indeed have a somewhat more complex way of computing what the h is at every time step, but for now, we could think of it as just the application of a function like this. Okay, and when we have a function like this with some weights, those weights are going to be the same weights at every time step. 
So when we look again at our picture on the screen, you see we have the function f that repeats, and then that means we have the same weights that are used, so therefore there's, some, there's a certain amount of weight sharing that takes place. Okay, so, so when we do our backpropagation, then we have to take into account the fact that we have some shared weights. Um, what it means is that the derivation of the gradient, the partial derivatives, is going to be a little different because of that. But otherwise, let's say you use a package with um, automatic differentiation, it will compute that for you. And the fact that the weights are shared is not a big deal. Um, so this can be done without any problem. Any questions regarding this? Good? Oh, one question, OK. Can h arbitrarily be either a vector or a scalar? Ah, yeah, good question. So is h a vector or a scalar? So generally speaking, h is going to be a vector. So here, so far, whenever we've talked about neural networks, every node was just computing a scalar. But um, more generally, in fact, in, in packages like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so on, then the assumption is that all, all the nodes, all, all the computational units are operating on vectors. And even more generally, they're operating on tensors that are multidimensional arrays. So here, it will make sense that um, in our recurrent neural network, we will have h that corresponds to a vector. And effectively, we can think of f as a function that outputs a vector. So it takes as, as input, you see, a vector x. And then h is going to be another vector. right? So we, this produces a vector. And now when I write sigmoid, think of it as uh, applying the sigmoid element-wise to the vector so that it produces a vector again. OK, so we're doing backpropagation through time. We're going to have some weight sharing, although it's not a big deal. What is a challenge um, in terms of the training is that now we have, again, the gradient vanishing problem. And more than that, we can also have a gradient explosion problem. So, so this is a little uh, difficult to imagine. But OK, we've talked a lot about how the gradient can vanish. The intuition here, when we talked about that, was that at every time step, in every layer, we would have partial derivatives where we multiply a bunch of factors. And then if these factors are all smaller than 1, whenever you multiply numbers that are smaller than 1, the product just gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and eventually you know, converges towards 0. Right? So this was the gradient vanishing problem. Now, if we look at the architecture of a recurrent neural network, what happens is that it's the same function f that is applied at every time step. So when you do the computation of the gradient, you're going to end up with some factors that are going to be essentially the same also at every time step. So now, clearly, if we have numbers that are smaller than 1, it's going to vanish. But now if we have numbers that are greater than 1, well, we're going to have the opposite problem. If you multiply factors that are greater than 1, then your product keeps on increasing, and in fact will increase exponentially in the length of the sequence. And, and that's known as the gradient explosion problem. Okay, so, so here, this is um, quite problematic, because um, like normally in a feedforward neural network, every layer would be different. So it's not clear that you would necessarily multiply by numbers smaller than 1 or greater than 1. And then overall, it could kind of balance itself. But here, you will likely multiply by the same numbers because you have the same function. So, so there is a risk that, again, it's just decreasing exponentially or it's increasing exponentially. <clears throat> OK, so we're going to see later on uh, some ways of dealing with this. Um, another issue is um, sometimes we would like to be able to take into account memory over a long range. So the beauty of a, of a recurrent neural network is that it can handle 
sequences of data of arbitrary length, but it is not clear that uh, it will necessarily remember the information from the early inputs. So you see, at every step, we compute some hidden state, and then it gets modified and modified and modified. But now the information from the first input that goes into H might get lost gradually at every time step when we modify H. So this is problematic in some applications like machine translation because here we could imagine that we have a sequence of words and now we're going to compute some information here about the sentence and then we're going to produce a translation. And the problem is that the first word in the translation is as important as the last word. Right? There's no reason why we should think that perhaps it's OK if the first word vanishes. It's information that needs to be translated in the same way as the last word. So for some applications where how far into the past um, an input was uh, should still be as important, then that's going to be an issue. Okay, so in other applications, like let's say activity recognition that we talked about where we have some sensor measurements, there it's kind of okay if we forget about the sensor measurements that happened a while ago because there is a, a natural um, importance about sensor measurements that are more recent. So then a recurrent neural network will have this natural forgetting, which is OK in, in that context. So, so, yeah, so for some applications, it's OK. But for some other applications, it's not. So if you want to have some long range dependencies, then this architecture is not ideal. We're going to see that um, some of the early inputs essentially vanish and, and, and do not contribute much. OK, and then the third problem, prediction drift, is also related to long range memory. But now this one is more about, let's say we're making a prediction. OK, so um, let's say I want to do um, activity recognition. And more than that, let's say I want to predict the activity several steps into the future. Or as another example, let's say we want to do weather prediction. Well, what you could do is use a recurrent neural network that takes as input measurements from the past, and then it would unroll for a couple of time steps, and then make a prediction about the temperature, maybe the wind and amount of rain and so on, let's see a few days into the future. So here, um, if you apply the recurrence, Okay, that w and, and here every time step would correspond to a different day, then naturally what's going to happen is that any sort of um, error into the prediction at each time step will build up as we start predicting further into the future, and then our predictions are going to start drifting. So this is um, a problem as well. Um, that, um, yeah, whenever you want to make predictions that are far into the future, then we don't have a, a good way just with this type of architecture to ensure that predictions that are much further into the future are going to remain accurate. OK, so now um, we can think of recurrent neural networks as a way of generalizing hidden Markov model. And for this, I'm going to draw a recurrent neural network that does indeed allow us to represent a hidden Markov model. And then this will help us as well understand some of the later concepts. <clears throat> OK, so just as a recap, Let's consider a hidden Markov model. So if you recall, we have y1, y2, y3, y4, x1, x2, x3, and x4. OK, so here 
The x's correspond to the inputs. And then the y's are the outputs. So for instance, these could be classes. These could be measurements. And now, um, the hidden Markov model, what is a little bit counterintuitive, is that we have arrows that go from the outputs to the inputs. And very often, people feel like it should go the other way around. But the reason is that here, the edges essentially indicate probabilistic dependencies. Right, so edges <coughs> indicate probabilistic dependencies. So here I have the probability of yt given yt minus 1. And then there's also the probability of xt given yt. Okay. And so that's why <coughs> we're going, we, we have arcs that go towards x. Um, so in the case of activity recognition, you see a person pr um, executes an action, executes an activity that corresponds to y. And then that triggers a measurement, um, which is x. Now we feed into our system x, and then we're trying to compute y. But in reality, in nature, what, what is um, the causal relationship is that we, we um, essentially execute some action or some activity y, which causes or triggers a measurement x. And that's why the arrow goes this way. Now, in a recurrent neural network, we're going to have, as well, our inputs, x1, x2, x3, x4. Now, let me introduce some hidden states, h1, h2, h3, h4. And then I'll have the outputs, y1, y2, y3, y4. And we're going to have arrows like this. <clears throat> so the main difference is that now the edges in a recurrent neural network, they're going to indicate functional dependencies. So in a recurrent neural network, the, the graph corresponds to the computation that we're doing. So here, we're using x to compute h. So that's why we have an arc that goes from x to h. And then we also have arcs that go from h to h and then from h to y, because we have corresponding functions uh, to obtain these. So here, concretely, um, we talked about just before that um, ht can be obtained by some function f of ht minus 1 as well as xt. And then for the output here, I can create another function. I'll call it g. <coughs> so g of ht will produce yt. Yes? Could you explain again why the arrows go from h to y? OK, so here the idea is that we're going to compute some hidden state. Um, this hidden state, sometimes we want to transform it further to produce an output. And then, so that's why we add an arrow like this. And then it will be used to, let's say, compute the, the probability of a class uh, let's say we're doing belief monitoring and activity recognition. Okay, so the idea is that uh, 
um, we can, I mean, it's not uh, always the case, but in general, we can decouple the hidden state from the output, and then we create a special node age that corresponds to the hidden state, and then another one for the output. Now, in some application, the output is the same as the hidden state, but more generally, we can ju then just say that the output will, will just depend on the hidden state, and perhaps we just need to transform it through some function g. And, and here again, we could imagine that um, this could be um, some nonlinear activation function that's applied to um, HT, like this. And then this one again, um, W applied to HT minus 1 plus W applied to XT. Right? So this is an, one example of how these functions could be defined. So we could have different set of weights that will transform further uh, what we need to produce the output. Okay, and now <clears throat> one way of, of thinking about um, how an RNN can be used to essentially emulate a hidden Markov model uh, in the context of um, classification, so um, activity recognition, what we did is uh, we have the, the forward algorithm that would compute y1 given x1, then y2 given x1 and x2, then y3 given x1, x2, and x3, and finally y4 given all of the x's. Right, so we can go forward like this, and in the same way for the RNN, if we look at the functional dependencies here, we can compute y1 based on x1, then we can compute y2 based on x1 and x2, y3 based on x1, x2, x3, and then y4 based on everything before. Okay, so we can go forward in, in the same way. Okay, so in hidden Markov models, we talked about several tasks. Right? And these tasks are not just for hidden Markov models, they're just common tasks whenever we've got sequential data. We talked about belief monitoring, doing some prediction, also looking at, at um, uh, computing in hindsight what was um, uh, a hidden state or a class. And now for hindsight, um, what we needed to do was essentially compute in a forward way um, what uh, some, some aggregation of, um, of our inputs uh, that occurred up to that time step. And then also there was a backward phase where we were accumulating information from measurements that occurred afterwards. So in some applications, like speech recognition, this is very important because often you do delayed speech recognition where you have um, essentially an entire sentence that is spoken and then at that point the system starts processing the entire signal to predict or to recover what were the words that were said at every time step. So in the middle of the sentence, right, there's a word and then that word, you can recognize it based on the audio signal up to that time and also including the audio signal afterwards. So when we do this, with an HMM, it's not a problem. We saw that there are ways of doing the computation so that the information can flow in a forward way up to the point where we want to recognize a hidden state. And then we have a backward phase that also brings information back in time up to that same hidden state. But now for um, a recurrent neural network, the architecture that I drew here has a problem. 
if I want to compute y2, and I would like this to depend on x1, x2, x3, and x4, if you look at this architecture, the way the arrows are pointing, it is not possible to have x3 influence my prediction for y2, or to have x4 influence my prediction for y2, because you see the arrows are only going in this direction. Right? So, so this is a, a limitation of this particular architecture. It only allows forward computation. But in some application, I also want to be able to do backward computation. So for this, we're going to consider a different architecture that is known as a bidirectional recurrent neural network. OK, let me draw a picture for that too. OK, so a bidirectional recurrent neural network uh, will have the following architecture. <clears throat> OK, so we have again x1, x2, x3, x4. Then h1, h2, h3, h4. Now I'm going to distinguish two different sequences of hidden states. I'm going to call these the forward hidden states. And let me create as well some backward hidden states. And then finally, I'll have my outputs. And what I can do is now link them as follows. So I'm going to have all of my inputs feed into those hidden states. Now the forward hidden states are going to be linking from left to right. The backward hidden states link from right to left. And then finally, the output is going to combine together one forward hidden state with one backward hidden state. So here, I'm going to link this and this, then this and this, these two and these two, and this one. OK, so if you look carefully, let's say that I'm interested in computing y2. And I would like y2 to depend on x1, x2, x3, and x4. Well, y2 depends here on the forward h2 and the backward h3. Okay, And now if you look at the forward h2, it depends on this block. So it depends on x1 and x2. And if you look at the backward h3, it depends on this block. So it depends on x3 and x4. So in this way, you see, I can aggregate information from before and after in order to have my prediction at y2. OK, any questions regarding this? Um, not in this particular case. Okay, here you see the backward h1 includes x1, but it's also in the forward h1. Okay, so if I want something for y1 that will depend on x1, then it's sufficient to just create a link on h1. So here, in reality, I don't really need the backward h1. Um, so what I would do is, in fact, just use the forward h1 and then the backward h2 to compute y1. Okay. Yes? Uh, I have a question. Uh, 
Okay, so now let's see how we can apply these types of recurrent neural network in um, some interesting applications. Um, in particular, some of these applications have the problem that um, we can't quite have a, a sequence of output that matches precisely the sequence of inputs. So the neural networks that I drew on the board here, you'll notice that you see they go from x1 through x4, and then there's y1 through y4, and there's a corresponding y for every x. So this is okay for things like activity recognition, where you have a measurement every once in a while, and then perhaps you want to recognize what is the activity at that particular time step. So there's, there's, a, there's a natural matching between the input and, and the output. If we're doing part of speech tagging in natural language processing, then it's the same thing for every word. You want to associate a tag, a part of speech tag, and therefore there's a corresponding output for every input. But then there's a lot of other applications where there are some sequences, but the, the input sequence and the output sequence don't match naturally. So like in machine translation, I might have a sentence in one language, let's say it has four words, and then in the next language, when we're translating, the output might be of a different length. There might be five words or there might be three words. Right? So different languages have sequences of words of different length and these don't match. Right? So even if I have a sentence of four words as input and then a translated sentence of four words, it's not clear either that the first word in the first sentence matches with the first word in the translated sentence. Right? So sometimes those sentences, they have their word ordering changed. Right? So, so here, um, these architectures that I drew, they naturally assume a certain amount of synchronization between the inputs and the outputs. So if we want to tackle uh, problems like machine translation, question answering, and also conversational agents that produce a dialogue, and we have an input se sequence. Uh, so in the case of question answering, the input sequence is going to be a question. And then the output sequence is going to be an answer. And here, there's even less synchronization. I mean, the output sequence, really, there's no reason why it should be the same length. And there's clearly no match between words of the answer versus the words of, of the, the question. And then when we talk about dialogue, conversational agents, same thing. A user says something, the next user responds and then the response does not have to be the same length or doesn't have to match. So how can we deal with this? So we can still use recurrent neural networks, but with um, perhaps a, a, a different architecture. So a common architecture for this is known as the encoder-decoder model, which is also known as the sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. OK, so here one approach is just to say that I'm going to have a first um, RNN that will correspond to an encoder. The purpose of this encoder will be to encode, or if you prefer to summarize, the input. So if I'm doing machine translation, <coughs> I've got a, a sentence as input, and then my RNN is going to read it and then summarize it. And then it's going to get summarized into a vector C. This vector is known as the context vector, and it's uh, if you want some sort of embedding of the input. So once we've summarized the input into this context vector C, then we'll want to produce the output sequence. So in the case of machine translation, that's the corresponding translation. For question answering, that's the answer. And for dialogue, this could be the response. So what we do is we have a second RNN that takes the context vector as input and then will produce some outputs here. So here the intuition is that let's say I have a, a, a sequence of words and I'm, let's say I'm doing machine translation so, so I'm going to process every word and remember um, I guess the, the meaning of that word into a hidden state and then combine the meaning of those words gradually into the hidden state. So effectively, you see all of those hidden states, 
they're capturing, they're summarizing my input sentence. Once I have the summary in the context vector C, then I'm going to use it to decode. And here decoding is just a general term to mean that I'm going to produce another sequence as output. So here the sequence in machine translation would be the sequence of words for the translation. So every Y is going to correspond to a different word. And the idea is that you see I have a summary of my sentence. It's a bit like you see if you're given a page, there's a sentence written, you read it, and now you put the page away, you remember the sentence in your head because you've read it, right? And now you start writing down what is the translation in the other language, but you remember in your head what is the, the meaning of that input sentence, right? So C is our memory where we remember what we've read so far. So based on that memory, now we produce the first word of the translation, but now as we produce the translation, right, we write the words one by one, and, and here it's, it's actually useful to keep track of how we're progressing as we write down those words. So there's going to be some more hidden states, so these nodes here are hidden states that essentially keep track of the progress of the translation. So I produce a first word, now I include this first word into my hidden state uh, to summarize essentially what I've translated so far. So then I, I know what should be the next word and so on. So this way I kind of keep track of what I've produced so far and then I can uh, gradually uh, produce more words that are coherent with each other. So that's the intuition behind this type of architecture. Any questions regarding this? Yeah. Why are you feeding this context vector in Y again? So yeah, I'm, I'm feeding the context vector into Y at every step because here we can think of Y as a hidden state that captures everything that's relevant. So at any point in time I should remember what it is that I'm trying to translate. Right, so the context vector was my summary of the sentence, so I need to remember that as I produce my translation, and also need to remember what I've already translated. So that's why I feed both C and um, the previous hidden state uh, that corresponds to my words that I've outputted already, and, and then all of that information is then used to determine what should be the next word. Um, right, so I guess, yeah, okay, that's a good point. So here in this architecture, C is used to inform the hidden state and is also used in the production of, of the Ys. So I guess here we could argue at some level that perhaps if our architecture is, is well designed, if we have the right functions, we would just need an arrow from C to the first hidden vector and then I don't need to have all these arrows here and I wouldn't need to have all these arrows here. But then based on our earlier discussion about information being forgotten over time, we've got the problem that if, if all we do, you see, is feed C as input here, then perhaps we'll know what we're translating at that point, but then at every step when we, when we modify um, this hidden state, we might gradually forget about C. So it's useful to, to be able to sort of like peek back. It's a bit like you see if you've read a sentence and now you've got a memory of it, but now every once in a while you go back and check your memory so that you don't forget what what it is that you're trying to translate. So that's what these arcs are doing, They're essentially allowing the, the recurrent neural network to remember and not forget because it might forget otherwise over time. And then same thing for the production. So here for those Y's we could argue well if C goes into these hidden states then why do we need C to influence Y? So it's the same issue is that even if it goes into H Right? then um, 
it, it's, it's still useful to, to have a fresh copy, a fresh memory of it at the time precisely when we produce Y. Okay, so I guess this is building redundancy into the information flow that we could argue you know, might not be needed, but in practice it helps, it makes a difference. Yeah? Is C really high dimensional? <laughs> yes, yeah, so C will be a vector, and this vector will typically be high dimensional, easily like 500 or 1,000 uh, values. Yeah, so here, as you can imagine, if C is going to encode an entire sentence, right, then you would think that the space of all sentences that one can create in any language right, is a large and complex space, so we better have a large embedding. Okay, so on this slide, um, we've got some examples of translations that were achieved using the model that I just described. So um, we've got some source sentences, or in fact here the, these are more like expressions, so some source expressions in English, and then we've got some possible translations in French, and they're, you, they're generally speaking quite good. Um, this middle column corresponds to um, a state-of-the-art translation model at the time. So here, historically, translation was done through probabilistic techniques um, that might include hidden Markov models with all kinds of other um, things, and in fact, um, up until roughly 2014, machine translation was, was difficult in the sense that it used to take a team of researchers several years to get up to speed because machine translation included a full pipeline of different modules that would compute different things. And then in this pipeline, if one module was not quite right and then it produced some errors, these would impact the entire pipeline. And so you really needed to have everything working quite well so that you would get a good system. And engineering all this was taking years. Okay, so, so the, the rule of thumb back then was that it would take a team of maybe 10 to 20 researchers, roughly three years to build some you know, a state-of-the-art machine translation system from scratch. But then in 2014, um, those researchers pr proposed um, to use a, a recurrent neural network and essentially showed that, um, I guess, one researcher with a desktop and perhaps uh, maybe, um, I guess, a fairly efficient desktop with, with GPUs um, could train a recurrent neural network on a large corpus of data and match the state of the art. Okay, and, and here training back then was taking on the order of weeks, but the point was that somebody could actually do that by themselves and uh, there was no pipeline, it was just one model, and in fact you did not need a lot of knowledge about linguistics and about all the intricacies of of uh, probabilistic machine translation, you could actually just do it by training uh, this model. Okay, so, so now uh, somebody could do in, in one week, one person could do in one week what a team used to take in three years. Okay, so, so this was a, a significant advance in, in that sense. Okay, so here if you look carefully, these are short expressions, and part of the reason why um, we have some short expressions is because um, this encoder-decoder model um, has the problem that it might forget over time easily, and then um, it needs to remember um, everything that was said in, in a sentence, and then so there was a need to improve um, long-range dependencies. Okay, so for this, um, there was um, a particular architecture that was proposed, in fact, back in the 1990s, known as the Long Short-Term Memory Unit, or LSTM for short. And this, uh, this LSTM um, has, a, well, it, 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 it regulates how hidden states are computed, 
And this is an example of an implementation of an LSTM unit. So the benefit of LSTM units is that they can mitigate the gradient vanishing problem and also they can facilitate long range dependencies by having some memory um, that can persist for longer periods of time. So if you want to do machine translation on long sentences, then you need to be able to remember um, what was said at the beginning and not forget about it, otherwise it, it just doesn't work. Okay, the key to the LSTM unit or the LSTM cell is the introduction of gates. So here you'll notice that at the bottom we've got an input gate, a forget gate, and an output gate. So these are three gates that essentially will regulate what happens to the input, what happens to the hidden state, and what happens to the output in the sense that we, whenever there's a gate, this gate will take a value between 0 and 1. If it is 0, it means that the gate is closed. And then whenever we multiply the gate um, here, like you see, this is an, an input gate. So, so it's a, a number between 0 and 1 that's produced by a sigmoid activation function. If it is closed, then it would be a value 0. And if I multiply by 0, it means that my input gets nullified to 0. Right? So it's the same as saying that we prevent the input from going into the, the cell state of the LSTM. Um, the forget gate does something similar with respect to the hidden state. And then the output gate also does something similar with respect to the output. Now this picture is not easy to understand because we have uh, several recurrent links. So there is one here, there's another one here. And then what is helpful, in fact, is to unroll this. So I'm going to draw on the board the unrolled version of this LSTM cell. And then we're going to see how it does correspond more or less to what we've already seen for a, a regular RNN, but then with the introduction of gates. Okay, so I'm drawing essentially a recurrent neural network um, as we've seen it so far. Now I'm going to modify this architecture to introduce gates. So what I'm going to do is for every link, I'm going to introduce a multiplication that will regulate what happens to these connections. So here, I introduce a multiplication, another one here, another one here, 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 and here. Okay, so essentially I change my computational flow to introduce some multiplications. And the idea is that each multiplication is going to take some input with a gate. So here, for this input, let me introduce an input gate. I'll just call it in gate. And now you see the idea is that the input gate is going to have a value between 0 and 1. If it is 0, then it means the gate is closed and x1 gets nullified to 0. If it is 1, then it, it allows x1 to flow through. That's the idea. We also have an output gate. 
Okay, so same idea. It will decide what happens to the output. So either H1 flows through with the gate open when it's one, or H1 gets nullified when the output gate is zero. And then we also have a forget gate. So let me put it here. So the forget gate will be like this. And I might as well add one here too. OK, and then there's our end gate as well that goes here. End gate that goes here. And then there's the out gate that goes here, and the out gate that goes here. OK, so we've got all of the gates. Now what's left is that we have to feed something into those gates so that they can compute um, a value between 0 and 1. So in general, all of those gates are going to take as input the x at that current step and also the h at the previous step. Okay, so, so the end gate here is going to take x1 and h, and then together is going to decide whether uh, we should let x1 flow through or not. Same thing for the out gate. So it takes x and h. Here we're going to have the same idea. So there's h and x here h and x. And then for the output gate, uh, like this too. OK, and then the forget gate also depends on the previous x. Or sorry, I guess the current x and the previous h. So it will depend on this. And here it depends on this. Here like that like that, and that's it. OK, so I know it's a little messy, <laughs> but that's the unrolled version, OK? Hopefully, you understand the intuition, right, that for every arc, right, there, we introduce a multiplication with a gate. The gate will simply depend on the previous, um, the previous h and the current x, OK? So that's one version of the LSTM unit. And what I drew here is the unrolled version of what is shown in, in this slide. OK, so, so this slide is, might be a little easier to see in terms of the arts, but maybe not as easy to understand as, as the unrolled version. OK, now when you look at LSTM units, so they were proposed in 1997. Uh, since then, there's been all kinds of variants proposed. And today, um, the variant um, that is used in practice, for instance, if you look in PyTorch, and then there's, uh, uh, you can create LSTM cells, then they would correspond to, to this picture here. Okay, so uh, the intuition is the same as what I explained, but maybe not, it's not as obvious. Um, the idea is that some adjustment that they make is that in, they, they have some hidden state h, and then it's going to be called cell state. So they change h to be c, uh, to be a cell state. And then they don't have an output y. Instead, they use h as the output. OK? So, so that's a little confusing when you look at this initially. Right, so they don't use Y for the output. They simply use H as, as the output. And then, in, and then for the, the hidden state, they actually call it cell state, and then they use C. So, so now that's the architecture. And then uh, there's some specific equations that are listed here. We've got the first three equations that are for the gates. So we have, again, the input gate, forget gate, output gate. Um, these gates are computed based on some input x and then the previous hidden state. 
So this is just like what I explained. But then after that, to compute the updates, so first we process the input. Um, so here to process the input, we actually combine it with a previous hidden state. And then that gives us um, C tilde. And then we use that to uh, compute now a, a cell update. So the cell update, so there's a previous cell that's multiplied by the forget gate. And then the process input that is multiplied by the input gate. So those two are combined together to give us the cell output. And then for the actual output of the network, um, so they never use Y, but they use H instead. So that is what is represented here. So this is the output H here. And then so there's the output gate that multiplies this. Okay, So it's uh, the same intuition. Um, the equations here are fully specified. And then you've got uh, um, an architecture that describes precisely what is being computed. It's just in a different form than, than what I explained here. OK? Any questions regarding LSTM units? OK, one thing to realize about LSTM units is that the introduction of gates is useful to prevent the uh, great and vanishing explosion problem because you see at um, every step when we compute the cell state then there are some gates that essentially determine what can influence the cell state. So as a result um, those gates can essentially make sure that the output doesn't grow, the output doesn't shrink, and then we also use, um, um, well actually, uh, yeah, they, we also use the tan h function, where the tan h function is going to produce something that is necessarily between minus one and plus one, so it does prevent the output from really just growing arbitrarily. Uh, so this will have some impact as well in terms of the gradient. And then for the gradient, there's some similar phenomenon where as a result, we tend to have gradients that do not shrink and arbitrarily low and do not explode either. In terms of uh, long range memory, the benefit of those gates is that they help to regulate more explicitly what stays into the memory. So here the, the cell state um, is what is being propagated from one time step to another. That's what carries the memory of the network. And this cell state, you see there's some gates that will determine if we forget what was already in the memory or not. So if we don't want to forget, right, then we have here a forget gate that as long as it's set to one, it would mean here that the previous memory just flows through. And then if we don't want to perturb that previous memory, then here the input gate could be set to zero. And as a result, there will be no um, contribution from the input. So we'll simply have a cell state that persists without being changed. Um, and then for the output, we have something similar where there's a gate that will decide whether we output something or not. And then if we do, then to what extent um, it will depend on, on the uh, hidden state. Okay, so, so the intuition is that here with those gates, we have explicit mechanism that the network can use to optimize what should remain in the memory, what should be added to the memory, and then it makes it easier to essentially have some persistence for longer range dependencies. Any questions regarding this? OK, very good. So LSTM units were proposed in 1997. But now, more recently, uh, this is in 2014, um, there was another type of gated unit known as the gated recurrent unit that was proposed and it was proposed in the context of, of machine translation. Here the idea is that we simplify the LSTM unit by removing the cell state. So all we're going to do is just have a, a hidden vector 
So we're going back to just having a, a hidden vector. And then instead of having three gates, we're going to have just two gates. And then there's going to be fewer weights. So this is the, the diagram for the gated recurrent unit. Um, the two gates are known as the reset gate and the update gate. So the update gate is the one here that will decide how the hidden unit, uh, how the hidden state is updated. So essentially, um, this gate produces a number between 0 and 1 that decides, so this number will, will decide whether the new input goes in to the hidden state or we simply preserve what we already had in the hidden state. The idea is that, you see, when I allow the new input to go into the hidden state, obviously I'm perturbing what I already had in the hidden state. Instead of having two different gates that are doing different things for this, we might as well have a single gate that will take a convex combination of the input and the previous hidden state. So this is why here there's a 1 minus. So the idea is that you see this ZT, which is the the update gate is a number between 0 and 1. If this is, let's say, 0.7, then we're going to have 0.3 for this branch and then 0.7 for that branch. So essentially doing a convex combination of the input and the previous hidden state, which is kind of more intuitive and, and allows us to reduce the complexity of, of that unit. OK, so in general, today, when it comes to uh, recurrent neural networks, LSTM units, NGRU units are very popular. Which one works best in practice is problem dependent. But often, the GRU unit is um, more efficient because it's, it's simpler, it has fewer parameters, and so on. And then it might perform better as a result of that. OK, any questions regarding this? All right, let's continue. OK, the next um, important thing regarding, um, uh, I guess, sequence modeling is that even though we can deal with longer range dependencies using LSTM unit and GRU unit through their gating mechanism, the reality is still that there is some memory that might get perturbed at every step. And, and then really, like whenever we include something from the input, we are perturbing what we have in the memory. So, so like there doesn't seem to be a way to really account for everything if we want to both preserve what was in the memory and add to this uh, some new input. So one solution to this is to create another architecture known as a tension. So here, um, the intuition behind a tension is that, let's say we're doing machine translation. Often what helps is that as you do your translation, so you've read your input sentence, you've stored it in memory, and now you start decoding by producing the translation. But then when you start the decoding process, it would be helpful if you could go back and check again what were the words of the original sentence. Because even if you have the original sentence in your head, right, at least you have the meaning of it in, in your head, right, sometimes just looking back at what were the original words helps. And then simply because in machine translation, very often you can do fairly well just by doing word for word translation. So if you're about to produce a word, right, it might be good to make sure that this word indeed does correspond to some previous word in, in the, the original sentence. So here, if we want this ability to go back and, and, and check what were those words, perhaps we can use an attention mechanism that will simply try to align every word in the output sequence with some words uh, in the input sequence, but not necessarily align them in order. It might align them in a different order, because different languages have words that come in different order. OK, so. Yeah, so that's the intuition. So in machine translation, we're going to align each output word with relevant input words. 
And we're going to do this by computing a softmax of the inputs. So here the idea is that we have um, a context vector that we compute. Um, but now instead of having a context vector that's just a summary of everything we've read so far, we could simply try to come up with a context vector at every time step of our decoding and make that context vector more dependent on specific words of the input sentence as opposed to the entire input sentence. Because you see, if you're translating, let's say, an entire paragraph or an entire document, you see, the initial approach that we saw would suggest that you would read the entire document, somehow memorize all of this, and then start decoding. But that's crazy, right? What we would do is more start producing the translation, but then go back every once in a while and then see what are the words that come next or the sentences that come next into the original language so that we can do the, the translation gradually. And then as a result, we want a context vector that uh, essentially will summarize the context or whatever it is that we want to, to produce next. It doesn't have to summarize the entire sentence, but just the, the stuff that matters for the next few words that I'm going to, to produce. So here, we can create such a context vector by essentially taking a weighted combination of all the hidden states associated with each time step into our encoding process. And here, this linear combination, I'm going to make AIJ be some weights. They're going to be obtained through a softmax. And then the idea is that this softmax um, is going to essentially produce a higher probability whenever I've got uh, an alignment between what I'm trying to output and then some, some input words. OK, and then when I talk about alignment, it could be as simple as just computing the dot product. OK, so this is mathematically how uh, attention typically works. We're going to have a linear combination, in fact, a convex combination. So we're trying to align something with a bunch of possible inputs. So we need to compute some um, weighted combination of those inputs. And then for this, we're going to see how well the output should align with each one of the inputs. And this alignment can be computed, let's say, by a dot product, and then turned into a probability through a softmax. OK, so let, let's draw a picture to understand this more clearly. OK, so I'm going to have my decoder uh, with y1, y2, y3, s1, s2, s3. OK, so this will keep on going. And this is my decoder. So these are the outputs, as usual. And these are going to be some hidden states. OK, so here I'm using s to denote a hidden state. And part of the reason is because I'm going to have hidden states as well for the inputs. I'm going to call those h. I want to distinguish the hidden states for the outputs versus the hidden states for the inputs. Now for the inputs. I will have here x1, x2, x3, and so on up to xt, h1, 
h2, h3, up to ht. Okay, and what I'm going to do is now take a weighted combination where here I'll have some weight A31, A32, A33, here A3T. Okay, and then this is going to feed into S3. Okay, so these are the inputs. Um, these are the hidden states. Here I'm taking a convex combination. Actually, let me do it this way. So the idea is that you see the input, as before, we're computing some hidden state at every time step. Now, when we want to create a context vector, instead of taking the last h and saying, this is my context vector, why don't we instead take a linear combination, uh, in fact, a convex combination of those hidden states, and then this way, um, we, we can perhaps align better with the hidden state that would correspond perhaps to the better uh, input for the translation. So when I'm trying to produce the third word here, perhaps I'm at a point in time where I'm about to translate a certain concept. And now that concept is somewhere in my input. But where is it? Um, this is where I'm going to have to compute some alignment. So these weights here, these A's, are probabilities that come from a softmax. And then I'm going to use them to take a convex combination of my hidden vectors here, such that then if, if one hidden vector has a higher weight, then it means that it produces a better context than the other hidden vectors. And that hidden vector might just capture better the concepts that I'm interested in for translation at this point in time. OK, so this was the idea behind using um, well, beyond the construction of, of this attention mechanism, so it allows us to uh, align what we're about to translate with the right part of the input, in fact, with the right H that has been computed in the encoding step. OK, so if I just go back to this slide, you see the A's are weights. These are probabilities that would correspond to a softmax. And then these are obtained simply by computing some alignment. So I would compute an alignment between, let's say, the previous S and then all of the X's so that I can compute what the next H should be. Okay, so that's the intuition. OK, so the use of attention like this um, really helped to improve machine translation even further. Um, if we um, look at some of the papers, so back in 2015, uh, so the following authors essentially started using attention in machine translation and then obtained the following results. So if you have a sentence, um, and now if you compare sentences of different length and you're trying to see with what accuracy um, 
you would translate those sentences. Um, here what this shows is that uh, for land, sentences of a certain length, we can obtain reasonable accuracy, but then at some point the accuracy goes down. And it goes down simply because um, those long range dependencies really become critical and, and it just doesn't work well. Um, even with LSTM units or GRU units that help to improve long range dependencies, um, they're still not completely effective. Now this curve here at the top is the one that uses attention and then we can see that they achieve results that are quite good and in fact don't decrease very much with sentence length and that's in part because you see the way attention works the way I've, I've drawn it here on the board you see every word in the input sequence will have a chance to influence what goes into the context vector for the next step in the decoding. And then when these words have some influence, it doesn't matter where their position is, right? So the early words are not necessarily um, less important than the later words, so they all have a chance to influence, and then um, how far in the past has no impact. Okay, so here on the y-axis, a common score that is used in machine translation is the BLUR score, which stands for Bilingual Evaluation Under Study. And the way to think about it at a high level, uh, this is not entirely precise, but still, is that this measures the percentage of translated words that appear in the ground truth. Okay, so um, the higher this percentage, the better, and, and then so higher the score, the, the better. Okay, um, all right, let's stop here and I'll finish off those slides next class. All right, so when it comes to doing machine translation, um, as we discussed, uh, there are some issues with respect to long sentences and this is where it becomes important to have a mechanism that allows us to uh, look back and as we do the translation, see what are the words that were in the process of translating. So um, in these results that we see on this slide, uh, the researchers essentially compared the use of a, a recurrent neural network with attention and also without attention. So you can see um, four curves. Uh, the top two curves are with attention and here this is measuring the accuracy in terms of the BLUR score versus sentence length. And here BLUR stands for Bilingual Evaluation Under Study. Um, and you can think of this as some measure of the percentage of translated words that appear in the ground truth. And here the idea is that we have um, uh, a translation, um, a candidate translation that is obtained by some algorithm. We want to compare it to uh, let's say a human translation that we treat as the ground truth. The problem is that the human translation is just one possible translation. There might be other valid translations, but then in terms of having an automated measure uh, that is simple, then what we can do is simply check what percentage of words that our candidate translation has in common with our human translation that, that we treat as the ground truth. And that's roughly speaking what BLUR measures and as a result higher is better. Okay so here those curves you'll notice that the top curve which uses attention the accuracy does not decrease very much as we increase the sentence length and this makes sense because when we use attention each time we produce a, an output word then we essentially have an attention mechanism that looks at the entire sentence that we're translating and then the attention will focus on the words that are relevant for the next word that we want to translate. So here uh, the intuition would be let's say that um, you need to translate an entire document right if you translate an entire document you would not just read the document 
put it away, and then start writing down what the translation is. You would read part of the document, translate part of it, and keep on reading, keep on translating, so you'd continuously look back and make sure that the words that you're outputting right, are aligned with what you're reading in the original document. Because remembering everything that is in the document is a lot, and chances are you're going to forget. Right? Now the computer has the same issue. Um, so a recurrent neural network normally you see will accumulate the input words and produce an embedding that uh, in principle captures the entire sentence of what needs to be translated. But in practice, the early words, they tend to be overwritten by some of the other words that we accumulate into this hidden vector. So because they, they get forgotten, then the quality of the translation uh, degrades as we uh, work with long sentences. So this is where attention becomes really important. So yeah, so this work was quite important because then it, it solved um, in an effective way the problem of dealing with long sentences. And as this top curve shows, you can obtain a, uh, a certain accuracy that does not degrade with length thanks to attention. Okay, so um, I've got on this slide as well two examples of sentences. So we've got on the top uh, an English sentence and then on the left uh, the corresponding French sentence. You'll notice here that you see the length of the sentences are not exactly the same. So for instance, um, if I take the word was, then in French it would be um, replaced by a et. So there's actually two words that correspond to that. So uh, very often um, with different languages, you don't have uh, a word for word alignment. Uh, the number of words might differ, and also the ordering of the words might differ. So, um, okay, so here what you see is, um, let's say that we're translating from English to French, then every column corresponds to the weights uh, of the attention mechanism. And then the higher the weights are, then the lighter is going to be the, the block indicating that we have a focus or an attention on some corresponding word. Okay, so in terms of word ordering, you can see here that European economic area, um, the ordering is changed. In zone economic European, essentially the ordering is reversed, and that's why you see the attention weights are such that um, the algorithm, the uh, the decoder figures out what word it needs to attend to and it's not bothered by the fact that the words are in a different order. Um, if we also look at the word was, uh, then this word is a verb that, as I explained before, uh, would correspond to a et, and then there are two weights because uh, there are two words essentially in the other language that would translate that. Okay, so the beauty of attention is not only that it helps in terms of um, dealing with long sequences, but if you want to see uh, what is the alignment, like what words correspond to what words in each language, then you can produce these little maps like this that show you really like what it is focusing on. So if you're not a native speaker in both languages and you're actually curious to see as well like what's the alignment, then you can get this out of uh, the attention mechanism. Okay, any questions regarding this? Yeah. Yes, okay, so here I, I did not fully explain the blur score. You're absolutely right. It's not just individual words. Uh, in fact, we would typically look at n grams and then compare the percentage of n grams that are in common. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so um, recurrent neural networks are great for dealing with sequences. Um, they allow us to essentially process sequences of arbitrary length, but then 
um, there are some situations where we would like to treat our data as not so much corresponding to a sequence, but maybe corresponding to a graph or, or also a tree. And so we can generalize recurrent neural network to these types of structures, and then they're called recursive neural network. So here, recurrent, recursive, at least in plain English, it's not clear that there's much of a difference. In the context of neural network, what it really means is that we're generalizing neural networks from chains to trees or even graphs. So I've got an example here where I have a sequence of inputs, but now instead of accumulating every input into a hidden state at every step, what we could do is simply transform those inputs and then combine them. So in this example here, I'm combining pairs of inputs together, and then I do this recursively, right? So I always just combine pairs until I produce an output. And here, we can think of the output as also some sort of embedding or a context vector that captures the meaning of, of our input. The difference is that this embedding is not produced sequentially by simply adding in one more input at a time, but instead it's aggregating um, the inputs according to a graph, right? So in this case here, it's, it's a tree. More generally, we, we could have a graph, and then the architecture of, of this graph could be anything we want. Now, how can we deal with um, uh, some varying length inputs, because at some level this just looks like a, a plain feed-forward neural network. But the key is to realize that if there are patterns, like for instance here, whenever I just transform a single input into a single um, hidden node, then I will use some, uh, some weights denoted by V, and then I use the same weights for all of these uh, single connections. Whenever I've got two uh, nodes that merge into one. So here I could imagine having a function that would transform this node based on some matrix of weights u, this one based on some matrix of weights w, and then produce the output. The idea is that the left node is, is essentially handled by u, the right node by w, and, and then I would do this for every pair like that. So it doesn't matter how many pairs I'm combining, right, I will always have the same weights u and w, and in this way I can deal again with arbitrary length. Okay, so, so the idea is that there's a graph, now this graph will have some rules about how I combine some of the inputs or some of the nodes at the intermediate layers, right, and then as long as I have a finite number of rules, a fixed number of rules, then I will simply do some weight sharing between all the applications of those rules. So you see here there's a rule for just doing this um, um, single connection and then I share the same weights V across all of these and then there's another rule here for combining two inputs into one node and then I share the same weights U and W across all these applications. Okay, so now you might ask, well, how, how do I design this graph? Like, what would I do to obtain a, a graph that makes sense in some application? So it, this is really problem dependent. But then if we consider um, language, it turns out that there's a rich history in linguistics uh, about what are known as parse trees. Okay, so a parse tree or a dependency graph is, is a common structure that linguists um, have devised to essentially capture syntactic information and also to some extent some semantic information. And then the idea is that um, we, we can build a graph that, that reflects the syntax but also could be useful in, in terms of computing and embedding. So I'm going to draw an example on the board and then we'll see um, how this could be useful. Okay, so let's say I've got the sentence, the king of France 
had an unhappy life. OK, so this is just an example. Now, for this sentence, if we do parsing and we come up with a, a constituency parse tree, then the first step would essentially be to come up with a parse speech tag. So here the is an article. King is a noun. Of is a preposition. France is another noun. Had is a verb. N is an article. Um, unhappy is an adjective. And then life is a noun. OK, once we've got the parse speech tag, then we can combine them into phrases. So for instance, here we can produce a noun phrase. Um, here too, we can have a noun phrase. Then um, we can come up with a, a higher level noun phrase by combining, oops, I made a mistake here. So this should be uh, of friends that is combined into a noun phrase. And then I can combine these three as well into another noun phrase. This can be combined into a verb phrase. And then finally, we can see that the sentence is essentially a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase. So in linguistics, uh, there's lots of rules that have been devised to essentially produce these parse trees. Uh, there's a lot of work in computational linguistics for um, essentially uh, producing parse trees as well from sentences. So let's say that you apply one of those um, uh, parse tree recognizers. Then you might end up with um, a tree that looks like this. And now you see there are different rules that are applied. So for instance, I recognize some words as being articles. So this is a specific type of rule. And then there's some other words that I recognize as nouns. This is another type of rule. And I could imagine having, you see, some operator with some weights for recognizing article, another operator with some weights for recognizing noun, and so on. And then for the higher levels, whenever I produce a noun phrase from a preposition and a noun, this is another rule that I could um, use with, with certain weights. And, and then I've got a different rule here. It also produces a noun phrase, but then this is from an article, adjective, and noun, and, and so on. So the idea is that there are rules that one can uh, devise. There's a finite number of them. It doesn't matter how long the sentence is. Essentially, any sentence that is well-formed, that is grammatical, we could produce a, a parse tree like this, and then we can simply um, associate with each rule um, some transformation that has some weights, and then we simply share the weights across all the applications of, of that same rule. OK, so this would give us another way of uh, uh, producing and embedding. And now, um, this, this actually um, is um, uh, perhaps more promising and, and more consistent with how we tend to understand sentences, right? So as humans, right, the way we understand a sentence, even though a sentence is a sequence of words, we don't understand necessarily the, the sentence just by looking at the words one at a time as in a recurrent neural network, but we tend to understand them by looking at certain combination. So like the king, that makes sense that it would be part of a noun phrase. And then of France also makes sense that it would be part of another noun phrase. And then an unhappy life, that's another noun phrase, right? So there are some building blocks that we understand. And then we combine them. So, so perhaps in terms of producing an encoding or an embedding for the entire sentence, this might just be uh, more natural, right? And, and then so some researchers have shown that we can obtain very good results um, by building embeddings in, in this way. Yeah? Does this have any application in Ireland? Like if we want to predict the next word and we know that it, like it, it makes sense to have a noun and not a verb, so does having a parsing help? Yeah, so it, it, it helps. Um, I, I don't have, I, I don't remember any results off the top of my head. I'm, I'm not sure, in fact, what is the state of the art today for, for this. But 
um, at least intuitively, if you have the parse tree as well, this is additional information. So now you would have both the sentence and the parse tree. As long as your parse tree is correct, that's additional information. So in theory, we should be able to obtain a better embedding uh, for, for the sentence. Yeah. OK. OK, so this completes this set of slides. So let's move on to the next set of slides. <clears throat>